Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jason Rodriguez with Z Prime. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Lawrence Jones with the Edison Electric Institute. Lawrence, how are you doing today? Thank you, Jason. I'm not doing. I'm not doing too bad. How are you doing? In your I'm doing fine. We have we have power back on here in in Texas, where I'm at, in, in Kyle. So feeling very grateful at Good. the moment. Good. I really appreciate you coming on to, to share some of your thoughts, not just on what's going on here in Texas, but also some of the bigger trends you're seeing in the energy landscape uh, that, are, that, are, that are going to happen in 2021 and maybe a little further out. Mm -hmm. But the first, first thing I'd really like to ask you is in 2013, you gave a speech in Sweden, I believe, where you talked a little bit about the changing weather patterns and the jet stream. Can you talk in particular about maybe one of the scenarios that you talked about then that, that that you're seeing come to life uh, today. Well, thank you, Jason, for having me. And yes, so in 2013, after I had finished the second version of the book, Renewable Energy Integration, I've started to play with different scenarios in my head as it, as it relates to weather and climate change. Because uh, at the time I was working with Alstom and obviously Alstom was building wind turbines. Uh, and, and so I was invited to speak uh, on a topic uh, of Arctic wind. And so I traveled to the northern part of Sweden, very, very cold that day, I remember. And one of the scenarios I was playing in my head was, as I had looked at some of the data from the, you know, the IPCC and some of these other institutions, it just seemed to me that uh, as the climate would be changing at some point, there was a possibility that you would have jet stream uh, dynamics changing in such a way that areas where we didn't have Arctic wind could actually end up having Arctic wind because of the jet stream changes, right? And so what I said then that was that, you know, the Arctic region itself has about 60 gigawatts of wind capacity, right? And I said, well, imagine if you could harness all of that wind capacity in the Arctic region. But then I also said, let's bear in mind that what we're calling Arctic today, and that was about 10 years ago, 2013, uh, maybe in the next decade or so, uh, due to jet stream movements, maybe those regions will become non-Arctic regions and regions that are Arctic, uh, non-Arctic regions will become Arctic regions, right? And so today when we have the situation, uh, because we've had polar vortices all over the world, we now have the situation, say for example, in Texas where you are, where you have an extreme uh, cold snap, which you've never seen you know, before, I guess. And you've seen similar things in other parts of the world that typically don't see these kinds of cold weather fronts. And so, what I said then was that we should prepare ourselves for a world where Arctic wind could appear in regions that typically don't have Arctic winds. And uh, sadly, it's happening now. And, and I think uh, we need to be build more resilience in energy systems around the world to deal with these kinds of changes in weather patterns. So, so how do you see you know, the Texas energy crisis it's, it's playing out now? How do you see that actually impacting uh, utility policy or a broader energy policy? You know, I think one of the things that's important here, and, and I'm one of those who, who have always said that in the context of crisis, whatever the crisis may be, we should always wait until we have all the facts before we start trying to come up with solutions and proposing ways out of this and how we not repeat what has happened. But I think more generally, when I look at the United States and I look at the rest of the world, where we've had similar kinds of, of uh, extreme weather events impacting uh, utility business, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in Japan, one of the things I think is very important to keep in mind is that resilience has to be front and center for all of us going forward as we design public policy related to energy systems. And so whatever comes out of the analysis and the studies in terms of what has happened in Texas, I think we need to keep in mind that going forward, the focus has to remain reliability and resilience. Those two words must be front and center in our thought process going forward. And so I think the broader, the broader policy implications is still, uh, it's still uncertain what they would be, but I think one thing that's definitely gonna happen is that we're gonna see renewed focus on resilience, building resilience infrastructure. The challenge with that, and we see this all over the world when I talk to utility executives in other countries, is we have to define, uh, come up with a, a, um, a formulation of ideas around what do we mean by resilience, one. Number two, we need to find metrics to help us calib calibrate what is resilient. And then I think perhaps more importantly, we need to communicate 
and make customers aware that resilience, in my view, is almost like an insurance, right? You, you, you pay for the resilience for that event that will occur. But until it occurs, you have to keep paying for it, right? And so we have to keep making the infrastructure more resilient as we see changes in weather patterns, whether it's bush wildfires or bushfires, like they call it in Australia, or extreme weather events that we have in the US now, or, or drought we've had in parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Australia. So I think as a globe, policymakers need to place a, 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 a very, very clear focus on the importance of resilient infrastructure and what it would mean, both from a financial standpoint, but also from a public policy standpoint. So you mentioned that you've been hearing from colleagues all over the world. Um, so, but I do, I do, I do want to ask: Has this surprised you? Ah, uh, well, you know, I, I think from a scientific standpoint, uh, it depends what you mean by surprise. Uh, I think what surprised me was the speed with which uh, things seem to have gotten out of control in terms of, of uh, you know, it just seemed to have gone so fast, right? Um, you know, I recall when I joined, uh, many years ago when I joined Alstom, uh, one of the first projects I did in the United States was to work as part of the wind modeling task force uh, to come up with models for, for the, um, the um, wind turbines back in the day. And I remember there were those who at the time, and this was like 2000, 2001, and people would say, you know, there's a threshold to how much wind you can bring on the system. And I was one of those who said, look, there really isn't a threshold once you have the necessary components for integrating large penetrations of renewable, but also you need diversification, right? And so what has surprised me to some extent is that all over the world, there seems to now be a recognition that you need to have diversification in your generation as well as grid portfolio to be able to deal with these kinds of events when they occur. And the other thing that has surprised me is that everyone seems surprised, right? I'm surprised that everyone is surprised, right? And, and uh, uh, I think the more important thing here is that kudos to the electric companies, they're doing as best they can to, uh, to address the situation, but it's an extreme event. I mean, by definition, an extreme event, it is something that you perhaps try to plan for, but you can't identify every possible thing that can go wrong. So I'm surprised that so many people are surprised. Uh, but uh, I'm also optimistic that I think uh, we will come out of this with a lot of lessons and hopefully there'll be an implementation strategy so that we don't find ourselves, whether you're in Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Sweden, any of those countries that have risk for extreme early events, we can learn from this and plan accordingly. Thank you. So now I want to move on to something you've also been talking a lot about involved in, in overseeing and kind of COVID, right, which is still still here in the U.S. and impacting us globally. Um, but how do you see the long-term impacts, uh, good or, or bad, impacting the utility sector? You know, one of the things, I just gave an interview earlier this week where I talked about electricity being so critical for the world going forward. In fact, I even in that interview said that uh, the future is going to be electric. Uh, but I think COVID has demonstrated a couple of things that we need to keep our eye on. The first thing is it showed us how central electricity is to society. Uh, fortunately for our industry as a global industry, during the pandemic for the most part, we had no major events on the grid, whether it's in the US, Australia, New Zealand, India, China, the lights were kept on for the most part. And, and that was very important because at the time we had hospitalization that was very, very high. And so people needed to have access to electricity. So the utility, I think, have done an excellent job in being able to prepare themselves to respond to the pandemic through collaboration, sharing of ideas, learning from one another. We had events where Italy will share the ideas with America, the, my American, the American utilities will share the ideas with Australia, a lot of international sharing. I think long-term, now that we've learned how to manage the grid under COVID in terms of the control systems working, dealing with workforce issues, making sure you have uh, enough staff if you're gonna do sequestration in the control center, all of these things we now have a case book in terms of how to do it. 
looking forward, there are three concerns that uh, I have when I talk to utility executives around the world. The first one is you need to reimagine what we mean by demand. And by that, I mean, let's assume coming out of this pandemic, 40% of your load in a city disappears because people decide to work from home, right? What does that do to your load centers, which now would lose significant amount of workload because not everyone is coming to the office. So you need to plan for that, right? The second thing is the impact of COVID on public transportation, right? And I know you want to get into the transportation issue, but let me just maybe uh, give some heads up here. If more people decide not to use public transport, they decide to use their own personal vehicles, what does that mean for how we go forward with the evolving energy system? And so I think electric companies around the world are thinking more and more about what is going to be my demand or our demand as a utility post COVID when we move to this world where we've got the pandemic under control. Now, on the flip side, Jason, there is this pent up demand that haven't been exercised over the last 12 months. And so once the virus is kept under control, there's vaccine, you could see a surge in demand because people would just go out there and enjoy life in a way they haven't done in a long time. So that's that other positive side. The last point I will make with regards to COVID is lifestyle is gonna change. And you will say, well, Lawrence, what does that have to do with the utility? Well, it does in a sense because if more and more people decide to work from home, right, then as a utility, you have to reimagine your workforce. So think before where, for example, you had crews that would go to, you know, to work out in the field and you would send four or five people uh, to work and now you may only send three, right? And, and so maybe your whole back office will work from home instead of coming to the office. So those kinds of things I think are, are we should keep an eye on as, as it relates to COVID long-term impact in society. But again, like I always say, uh, these things are all uh, speculation. Things could change, there could be wild cards, but I think we need to start running these what ifs in our head as to how COVID will change society after we've gotten the pandemic under control. So moving to another topic here, which which you've also uh, been been featured in another article on about the new the new administration and how that plays into our coordination uh, with with other global partners and how that can be a positive force for for igniting. Um, change in the energy sector and addressing some key issues from decarbonization, um, electrification, and, and, and even resiliency in, in cyber, probably to some, some impact. So how do, you, how do you see this new administration playing in terms of how we, we work with, with global partners? This is an excellent question. So uh, coincidentally, today, uh, February 19, the U.S. is formally rejoining the Paris Agreement. I think the documents have been signed or something more formalized has been done. So, so that's the first indication. I think the international community is looking at the U.S. return to the Paris Agreement and to other international engagements as a very positive sign. Look, most of the events and the issues facing the world today are global. Uh, we cannot solve them in isolation. Uh, I think international relations is going to be key uh, if we're going to address not just the challenge with, uh, you know, with the climate, but also the pandemic. We do not know when this pandemic is going to be done. There could be other strains that will appear. There could be other forms of infectious disease that could affect the planet. You have issues on, um, you know, injustice. Uh, you know, we have the George Floyd situation that spread across the world. So you have equity issues. So I think all of these issues uh, have to be viewed through a, <clears throat> a global lens where people can learn and share ideas. I always say that, you know, the virus could not be contained because there are no borders that will block the virus. It could just get trans, you know, transmitted, right? The same thing with ideas. Ideas spread very fast. And so the more we can work together as an international community, which is what the Biden administration has set out to do, and it's, you know, it, it's a good sign for the international arena, the better it would be because now we're talking with each other. We're sharing ideas. We can learn from each other. 
Um, I think it's going to be very important to understand the geopolitics of, say, dealing with climate, uh, dealing with the pandemic, uh, but even dealing with the economic system we have in front of us. So I think there's a positive uh, uh, breath of fresh air, I guess, that I'm hearing from uh, diplomats and others in Washington or in, in Brussels and elsewhere. But I think everyone I have spoken to so far in Europe and in Australia and New Zealand their concern is, well, will this last, right? Will they be there for the long haul? So I think all in all, all the indications so far from the current administration has been what the rest of the world has been wanting to hear. The proof will be in the pudding. What do we then do in terms of implementation and execution? Final question here is EVs uh, continue to be a, a, play a bigger role today. Uh, and are expected to play a bigger role in all of our lives and, and touch the, the industry you and I both work in. So how do you see this evolving in, in, in 2021? And, and what makes you really excited about this is the moment to where um, you know, electric becomes uh, the mainstream in a lot of respects here in the U.S. and, and across the globe? You know, I, I really like this question because um, in New Zealand, there's a little town called Christchurch. And I visited Christchurch. We have uh, members there as well. And, and so in Christchurch, it's a very nice little electric vehicle that was manufactured or built in 18 something. So way back then, it, it's, it's in New Zealand. And when I visited, I saw it, I said, wow. And he said, you know, Lawrence, this, the CEO said, Electric vehicles have been around for decades, hundreds of years, right? But it's only now that we've reached an inflection point on a couple of things that are coming together. And you have the technology when it comes to battery. You have the propulsion in terms of the electric propulsion, what it means, the new advancements that have been made there. And you just have a change in customer's expectation, customer desire. And then obviously you have the clean energy sort of a transition that is driving all of this demand for well, cleaner types of, uh, of uh, transportation. So I am very excited that looking at the numbers, you could see, um, in fact, I always say not just electric vehicle, I talk about electric mobility because <clears throat> whether it's in sub-Saharan Africa or take a city like Lagos, Nigeria, that has you know several million people in that city or mega city, or take Mumbai, India, right? These cities are congested as they are currently, but they're only going to get more congested. So it's not even having electric vehicles that are four wheel. Now you have the two wheelers and the three wheelers. So I think electrification of transportation is going to be a very, very major area to focus on. Uh, you know, a lot of the discussions around, you know, meeting Paris goals by different governments or net zero goals uh, for many interesting reasons began by looking at the power sector, right? But the last decade, power sectors around the world in many countries have really done a good job in beginning to reduce their emissions, right? In the US, for example, the investor-owned utilities have done an excellent job. We don't talk about it that much, but that's because we don't like to brag. But we've done a good job in reducing the emissions from, uh, from, uh, from our systems. Now, where I think we are, as we reduce emissions, the focus then becomes, let's look across our broader economy. And one place that the focus is now is on transportation, right? And so in developing countries, in India, in China, uh, uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a huge need for mobility. And those uh, means of mobility would be electric, right? So there's a bright future for EVs, uh, or electric mobility, uh, there's a very interesting future for the utility sector. The challenge we have, and this is something I think we don't talk about a lot, is how do we deal with the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure? Uh, in some utilities around the world, they are allowed to own the infrastructure. In others, they're not allowed to own the infrastructure. So I think finding the right balance of who gets to build the infrastructure, who gets to operate the infrastructure, and how do you integrate? I like to call just two interesting cases for your audience, Jason. Uh, people want to sort of see how fast this is moving. I'll go to the UK, right? UK has a very aggressive goal of going all electric over the next decade or so, right? 
how does the grid get prepared to integrate all of that electric transportation? The other place uh, I, will, I, will, I will highlight is Norway, right? Norway has high penetration of EVs, it's getting even higher. Again, how does one integrate all of that renewable? So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the future. I think there's a lot of work that's gonna go into the EV space and uh, electric utilities will be there ready to assist. And uh, once we have the right policy frameworks in place to make sure that fleet electrification, you know, and some of the big block, uh, you know, trucks and all those things that have been electrified, that they're ready to, to be integrated onto the grid. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. I really appreciate you joining us today to share some thoughts. And I hope you'll join us again soon because uh, I'm sure there's, there's a lot more uh, we can talk about in the near future. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jason, for having me and be safe and stay warm.